what I, what we are doing in the workshop is a sampling of a process. This process is what the perfect living masters give us when we get initiated. They connect us with the rope with which they can we can be pulled out. That rope is all the way down from the top of liberty, freedom, and our true home, all the way down right up to where we are. What is that rope which they hand down at initiation so that we can catch the rope and get out? That rope is a naturally existing, naturally existing expression of consciousness, which does not need mind or senses or body. It is a naturally existing resonance, a melody, a song, a sound, an expression that exists at all these stages right up to the physical plane, through to our ultimate true home of totality and universality, and never breaks in the middle, is very strong and thick, never lets go. If we can get hold of that special strength and special means, we go home directly. We, how do we describe that? This special link that we have, and that can be found, the one end of it, our end where we have to catch it, is the third eye center. We go to the third eye center and grab this rope, we can go all the way back. Nothing else is needed, no other method is needed, no meditation, no mantra, nothing. You grab onto that rope. What is this rope? We have had a very hard time, and the mystics have had an even harder time to describe it. This is what shall we say? It's an expression. How do you express consciousness? Consciousness is understood to mean a receptive thing which becomes conscious. When we talk of the word consciousness, we are constantly thinking that it is something that becomes conscious, as if it is a receiver. What can consciousness give? Consciousness, awareness, is a means of getting something, being aware. What can it give? How does it look like outside without receiving anything? If we are not conscious, what is consciousness like? Very difficult question. It is an expression of the truth, of love, of reality, of God. We don't know what to, what to say. It is so difficult to express. We do not know any word that can describe the expression of consciousness. And therefore, in limited in vocabulary, the mystics rested themselves in all culture, in every religion that I have studied in the world, with one expression, that word they could not find, so they called it the word. What can we do? We can't find anything else. Let's call it the word. It's an expression. It's something we can listen, something we can receive. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was how more plainly could you say? What word? What kind of word was that? It was God. They identified that creative power to be God. When that consciousness was a creative power, and we call it God, it was the same word. It still was consciousness. It still was the creator. All things were made by him, and nothing was made that was ever made. So nothing can exist. Now, I am not quoting only from the Bible. From the Rig Veda, that the nod, that sound, which is little translation of a singing word, the singing word was the creator, and nothing was made except for the singing word. You go into other text, the Shabbat, the Subhut, the, the harmony of that, the melody, the resonance. You can use any word. How can a song, how can a sound, be so strong, so powerful, that it houses consciousness itself. It can't be an ordinary sound. It can't be a sound that you can record. I have not heard that sound on any tape recorder here. I have heard a lot of beautiful meditational sound. I have heard a lot of beautiful music. But that music, the unstruck music, going on continuously. Will it surprise you if I tell you that that music is inside you all the time, 24 hours. So long as you are alive, it will be in the body. You die, it's still there, but not in the body. That music was struck in the beginning of the creation and will stay on till the end of creation. In fact, the music was there even before the beginning of creation. That is how it could create. 
therefore that music that sound which is the beginning of everything is the rope that links us with every level of consciousness so when we talk of initiation by a perfect living master we are not talking of an ordinary method or a mantra or some technique of doing something it's a link with that sound current it's a link with the melody it's a link with reality it's a link with conscious sound if i can say that it's a link with sound that is conscious it is a link with the real form of the master which is that consciousness the external form the physical form of a perfect living master is nothing but a symbolic expression outside a true form that really functions that really communicates with us in that physical body we call the perfect living master the true form is the sound resounding within ourselves that is why the perfect living master is always with us once initiated he never leaves us we can verify again and again the connection between the resounding self inside and the perfect living master so the beauty of this system is that once you go within and have contact with your own self in its melody in its sound you can you have then a passport to the highest place if the connection has been made by a perfect living master with that sound current within with that consciousness energy within if he connects you there which is the very purpose of initiation you guaranteed access in time depending upon your own evolution but guaranteed reaching the highest level of a true home to universal consciousness this sound inside can be heard we can hear it at every level we can hear it with with astral ears with causal with spiritual it's truly total it's always there of course the nature of hearing changes but we can hear it how does it sound if we were to go within how would it sound one mystic says if you keep quiet you will hear the sound just keep quiet if you can keep quiet for a few seconds you will hear it no he doesn't mean keep quiet with the tongue he means keep quiet with the mind if you don't keep on what do they call when you keep on speaking blah blah chatter chatter you keep on doing chatter 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 in your head you don't hear it because you're hearing the chatter but if you don't chatter you can hear the sound if you can hear the sound listen to it attentively because it is not coming from outside it is coming from the self when you listen to something coming from the self you are automatically pulled to the self you need nothing else listening to the sound it draws our attention to the self and all the experiences of light and other phenomena that we talk of at different levels comes naturally when we concentrate on listening to the sound because listening is the process which gathers our attention to the sound which is our own self so this is a very simple great master told me this is a royal road that is a very tough people will make you head stand upside down do various kinds of yoga sleep on nails don't try those go on the royal road royal road lead an ordinary life lead a full life enjoy this world be ready to enjoy the next but don't let go of the sound current inside hold on to that and you made it if you haven't gone you still made it by holding on to it so this shabad this sound current this word this beautiful melody inside is a secret you have heard of secret teaching that there is a secret path this is a secret path i'm sorry for all those who wanted to keep it secret in the past i'm announcing it today this is a secret path there is a sound inside us which is not man made it cannot be written or recorded which has no beginning no middle and no end it's a continuous sound it's both along with the consciousness and can be heard by anybody from a child of 5 years to a old person of 100 years and everybody in between man woman or in between it can be heard by everybody who has been born here as a human being not other human being and is the real royal road the open sesame to the highest levels of consciousness and therefore our true home so the practices which i was telling you earlier are really designed to take us to the sound current really designed to take us to the center of our own self i try to make it simple somebody told me aren't you trying to oversimplify by telling them this is how it is that you can just draw these lines and go back and third eye center it doesn't happen like that because i know the difficulty when we try to sit behind the eyes 
we are moving around so many times at other places and thinking it's behind the eyes. For example, close the eyes, you say now there's the darkness, we assume the darkness is inside. And therefore, when we feel there we are sitting, we imagine and look at ourselves a little bit, small form of our sitting. And we say there we are sitting in the center of the head. Now, if you keep that vision where you are sitting and then bring your hands up, when the eyes are closed, bring your hands up towards your eyes. You will be astounded. You just crossed the place where you were sitting in the darkness. You see what it means? It means that the space, that little space in front, the darkness which you thought was inside the head was actually just outside the eyes. Otherwise, how could you take your hands past that position and touch your eyes? The truth is we are so used to seeing with these eyes that even what we think is inside the head, we are creating just outside the eyes. It's not easy. But if you hear the sound, if your attention goes within, automatically you go there. Ultimately, the process of centering you, the centering of consciousness behind the eyes is automatic. When meditation is a regular practice and you sit and try to imagine you are there, automatically you will come to the point when you will be centered there. The first sign will be you will see the sight, the, the, hear the sound and see the light automatically. If you are there even for a little while, the light and the sound come. It is not, uh, it is not induced, it doesn't, doesn't have to be suggested to yourself, it comes automatically. That sound itself has a light. The sound shines with the light, they are not two separate things. The light and sound are the same. And they are, that is the real royal road inside. And our objective is to go to the third eye center and get connected to that light and sound. And on that light and sound, to be able to center ourselves more and more within our true self till we discover the reality. So there is great importance in what I am suggesting to you to go with it. To summarize all that I have said in the afternoon session, wait for the light and sound. If you get that, hold on to the sound and listen attentively, no other method is needed. If anybody can hear the sound, no other method is needed. The sound is not, it is very strong, very audible, very beautiful, very melodious, has a strange pattern in it. But as it comes into the grosser form, then when our attention is in the body and we still think we are in the body, when we listen to it, it has different physical aspects. For example, it sometimes looks like it is like a like a thunder. Sometimes it looks like it is birds chirping. Sometimes it looks like little bells ringing. Sometimes it looks like like a truck passing over a bridge. Sometimes it looks like a uh, like a <clears throat> sound when a, a motor stops and in an echo echo kind of sound over a covered hall. Sometimes it has a, a sound just of an echo, and we don't know what the echo is of. You can see the chan, that kind of an echo. But all these practice sounds don't have an attractive pull. But they are good for us to practice listening. They have come and descended to the physical level as we are conscious of the body. Even though we are sitting at the third eye center, these sounds emerge and we can practice on them to center ourselves. Whichever sound comes, we should listen to it. But eventually, if we listen intently, the sound changes to a bell sound. Ting, 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 it will become like a bell. Or ting, ting, ting in a distance. Or some far off sound of a bell. Or two bells, one far and one near. When you hear these bell sounds, we are centering. But this is not the sound that can pull you up. The sound that can pull you up is a very strong resonant bell sound of a big gong. It's not related to the blood circulation, not with the pulse, it is not connected with physical activity at all. And that sound, which resounds like a bell, it has a peal of a bell. That means it is not a continuous sound, ups and downs in that cell. There is a movement, sine curve in that cell, in the sound. And that sound can pull. When you hear that sound, it pulls you and makes you feel you are losing the body. You are going. Some people, when they hear that sound, they run, they are going to die. Actually, they are going to experience death, but while living, they get frightened. It has happened to some people. 
So that is why this is a very gradual process. So you get used to it. You don't actually die. You can stop listening and you're still back again. Gradually, if you practice, then you can experience the pull of attention so that you become unconscious of the body and conscious of the rest of yourself. That bell sound, if you keep on listening to it, you almost travel with it. If you travel with the bell sound, then the light increases a lot. And you can see and you think it's because of that light you are seeing, but you are seeing because of your consciousness. You see a new world, whole world in which you can fly. You see that this is where it all came from. You find the original version of creation. And then you realize that what you were seeing in day-to-day -day life was a copy from somewhere else. The original version is discovered only by being with the bell sound. Inside. As you go on the bell sound, the peals of the bell become longer. Instead of tong, 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 they become tong, tong. As they become very long, you can almost feel you're riding one peel. Almost like they produce the om sound, om, as if it is just one peel of a bell. It becomes straightened out and becomes a continuous sound. And then as, it, as you go along with it, it changes into still more melodious forms taking you to higher levels. At every level, it becomes more melodious and more subtle and not simply connected with the rhythm that we are accustomed to in this world. So that sound holds the key to where we are. And by listening to the sound, we can also verify what's happening because we are having those experiences which are so look like so new. Till the memory comes back, that that's where we started off from. And then it looks all the way different. But this whole experience of being able to fly into regions through a sound is a remarkable possibility that the perfect living masters give us in a very simple way that is practicable right in the physical world. So that is why the introduction I am giving to you is to prepare you so that when you are initiated by a perfect living master, this is what you are going to get. And there is a great potential to get this particular benefit of connection of the attention to the sound. That is why this particular yoga or union, oneness, has been called the Surta Shabda Yoga or the attention sound yoga, which means the audible life current. The audible life is being presented to us in the form of the sound. The attention can be connected and we can go along with it. So, if in the next exercise you hear sounds, don't get frightened. In one workshop, there was a very devoted person. He, he, was, he came also to speak in the same workshop in the Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship some years ago. And he, he were, we were both speakers and we sh shared neighboring rooms. And uh, so, uh, he heard me speak about the sound, immediately came to my room in the evening and he said, I have been going to doctors to get this sound treated. I thought there was something wrong with my ears. They can't find anything. I hear it all the time. I'm hearing it now. I say, congratulations. You're on the right path. He thought he was, there was something wrong. He said, nobody has ever spoken like this. Nobody told me there's an inner sound which is of any value on the spiritual path. So if in the course of these exercises, any one of you hear sound, don't get worried. You're on the right track. Yes. Stop doing the simran and listen to the sound? Yes. They're all, they're all the time, you should do that because I remember Craig Master saying we should, you should ignore the, ignore the sound. That is only if the sound is not steady. Supposing you're doing simran and the sound comes and you stop doing simran and the sound disappears. The sound is there because of simran. At that time, to stop doing simran is not worthwhile. But when the sound becomes steady, then give up. Are you ready for the next session? Now remember the key. The key of this is love and devotion. Mantra without love and devotion is hollow. It is like churning water hoping to find cream. It has to be some milk or something. So there must be some love and devotion in our meditation to get real results. So now when you sit, forget the flowers and the candy, think of the beloved. Repeat your mantra, real one or the temporarily acquired one which you made up, but use it with the beloved in mind, somebody you love, somebody who is so important a part of you that you can forget yourself. Put the picture of the beloved in front of you, which is called dhyan. 
contemplation. To visualize the picture of the beloved is called contemplation. To speak the words, repeat the words is called Simran. To listen to the sound is called Dhun. All these three constitute good meditation. If you can, depending upon the circumstances, switch from one to the other or use in combination, you will find the session beautiful. You find where the third eye center leads us. So use the mantra to stop the mind from straying away with thoughts. Use the contemplation to build up the feeling of love and devotion. And use the sound to hold you on there when you can hear it. Combination of these three you use and see if you can stay longer in that beautiful space called the third eye center. Close your eyes and begin. Three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look the side. Come out. Come out. How was this one? Better than before? Those who felt this was a good experience, raise your hands. Thank you. Those who thought this was like any other experience, raise your hands. So it looks like it was better than before. Yes. The first time we did it before the lunch, uh, I saw a strong light, like the gentleman was saying, and the two big eyes in front of me. They were your own eyes. My own eyes. Yes. Well, <clears throat> uh, just like we cannot see our own self, except in a mirror. Here we don't have a mirror, but the space that we create becomes a reflector. And our own eyes and our own light is seen in front. Welcome. Any questions on this exercise at this time? Any question on the experience or on the technique? Either you are all satisfied or you gone to sleep. Yes. <laughs> but, but it gives a sampling of where we have to go, where the truth is. Yes. In that case, I'm going to do some questions that may come up later for people regarding um, sound being bilateral on both sides, the sound coming just on one side, the sound coming in the middle. Does the sound manifest itself in different ways? Yes. What does it different ways mean? <clears throat> if the sound manifests on one side, you listen to it. If the sound manifests on both sides, listen to the right. If you have sound only on one side, you have to listen to it. There is no other sound. If you have sound on both sides, listen to the sound on the right. Sound is actually coming only from the center. It gets deflected to one side or the other depending upon the strength of the mind or the soul and our sanskars, our karmic situation. So when the mental power is strong, it tends to take the left side. So when the sound is strong on the left side and you can hear a weak sound on the right side, you should listen to the weak sound till it becomes strong. Actually, both come from the center. And eventually, as you progress, the sound will only come from the center. Yes? If you're not meditating. Sound is there irrespective of meditation. Sound is not dependent on meditation. Meditation is a technique of putting attention on it. Those who have heard the sound, they hear the sound all the time. They don't have to meditate. You hear it, you do hear it, does that mean something? Yeah, when you hear it, it's good. <laughs> Saying here, listen to it. Yes. It can go, go meditate. Is that yes. What I'm saying? Yes. That is the obvious message. Any other question? Yes. I don't know whether I understood you correctly, but if I hear the sound from the center, should I pay attention to the right side? No, no. If you, if the sound is in the center, no problem. Only if the sound is on both sides, then listen to the right side. Any other question? Make a point. Um, by experience, it's, it's clear to me that it isn't necessary that the mind be absolutely quiet in order for the sound to be uh, to be heard. And point the fact, 
If you listen underneath the chatter of the mind, if the mind wants to chatter, one can allow it to do that. But listen for what's underneath the chatter and you may find something you weren't expecting there. Right. The mind should do its own job, you do yours. Ultimately, you can't stop the mind. All these techniques of repetition of words, mantra, simran, is not to quieten the mind. It is to make the mind speak your tone, your tune. Keep it busy. You keep on doing your work. I am busy with mine. This is very easy if you know the mind is not you. The biggest problem in our spiritual growth is we identify ourselves with the mind. We don't find a difference. When the thoughts come, I am thinking like that. That's me. Once you associate and identify yourself with your thoughts, who will you tell to keep quiet or not to keep quiet? When you find all this chatter inside the head is the mind, not you, that you are a patient listener. And you identify one with the mind, one with yourself. And the distinction is clear. Then it becomes easy. Let the mind do its own job, you do yours. And remember the simple rule. If you don't know who is the soul, who is the mind, what is the soul, what is the mind, remember the one speaking in the head is the mind. The one listening is the soul. Very simple. You are a listener, basically. The more you listen, the more intently you listen, the more you practice listening, inside and outside, more you become a listener in this world and a listener in meditation, the closer you are to yourself. So identify yourself with the listener, not with the speaker. The chatter is from the mind. Yes. Any other question? Yes. When you are listening to your real self and you want to move back, does your mind ever stop chattering at that point? Or it chatters differently? Or it's more... <clears throat> it chatters all the time. But we don't pay any attention to the chatter. So it goes on chattering, chattering. But we are so interested in the wonders of what we are watching. We ignore it. Yes, but one other thing happens. We have a very wonderful mind. I don't want to decry the mind. Some people think I am an anti-mind person. And that I am against the mind. I am not against the mind. I, I am not against the mind at all. In fact, I like the mind. It does a better job than we do. It's more consistent. Its job is to stop us from going within. It does a good job. Its job is to distract us. It does a good job. Whatever it has been assigned to do, it does a very good job. So how can I decry such a uh, wonderful instrument that is working inside consciousness? I like the mind. All I don't like it, that we submit to the dictates of the mind. I want that we should use the mind to carry out what we want. I want the mind to be the slave, not the master. If the mind is acting according to our spiritual will, it's a wonderful thing. Make it a friend. The mind that listens to you instead of chattering and telling you what to do is a good mind. So the mind that is consistent with your spiritual goals, that also enjoys the spiritual journey. While you are seeing the light, the mind that thought also say, wonderful, wonderful. It's good. Nothing wrong with that mind. Don't try to put it on the shelf. But the mind that says, I'm tired. I want to get away from this. And this is too long. When are we going? That's the kind of mind to put on the shelf. But the mind that is helping us is a good friend. The mind is our worst enemy when we start on the spiritual path. As we grow and the mind gets some joy out of it, it becomes our best friend. It also starts enjoying the spiritual journey. Then it says, let's, let's do meditation. It is wonderful. Because mind's weakness is very simple. We know it. The mind has a weakness. Whenever you know somebody's weakness, you can catch that person on it. The mind's weakness is, it loves pleasure. Give it any kind of pleasure, it loves it. Suggest to the mind this is a very pleasurable experience, it will love it. That is how the mind creates desires, creates attachments. Mostly the motivation is pleasure. If that is so, and we know the weakness of the mind, introduce it to some of the pleasures that come in meditation. When it finds the meditation pleasurable, the mind will become your friend. Go along with it. Till then it will oppose you. So take advantage of the weakness of the mind and give it a bait. In fact, I asked great master once, Master, you tell such beautiful things, lovely things are inside and lights and the journeys without wings and you can fly. You make it sound so attractive. Are you trying to bribe the mind? He said, yes. It is true. At least give it something 
look forward to and go along with you. Otherwise, it keeps on resisting, pulling you back. Show it some pleasure and it will go with you. <clears throat> this uh, mental, when we start meditation, it is dry. We call it dry because there is no pleasure for the mind in it. We are keen. We are keen and seeking and doing everything. But the mind is restless. The mind is restless because meditation is dry. There is nothing for the mind to enjoy. So the mind says, no, this had, had enough of it. This is too much. Now let's get up. It's over now. It's enough for today. These kinds of arguments the mind gives when it is not pleasurable. Once meditation becomes pleasurable for the mind, it doesn't uh, come in our way. We start helping us. So we have to wait till the mind makes it pleasurable. Yes. I find it pleasurable. Uh, and it's telling you, well, it's time, you know, you've had enough of this meditation. And it's telling you to get, come out. Uh, do you listen to it the first time? Do you listen to the, you ignore it the first time and listen to it the second time? Or, I mean, how much effort should you make at the time that it's telling you to get out to, to, to try to not do it? You know, you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> <Your mind. laughs> You mean how much fight you should put up? How much should you... Now, any answers? How much fight should you put up with the mind? When the mind comes in your way. You are a seeker of truth and you know the truth is within and you want to go within and the mind says, it's enough, let's get away. We need to do something else. We'll come back to it. We'll do it later. We'll do it after retirement. There's no hurry. We have a long number of years. This is I have a whole time job now. I can't do it. I'm busy. <laughs> See, the mind can stall this. And if you want to fight the mind, how far should you fight? Is there any answer to that? Yes. If you fight the mind, the mind wins. Yes, he's given the answer. He's a professor, he knows. You don't fight the mind, you deal with the mind diplomatically. And go around it. And say, come on, we're not fighting, we're doing something for your good. We're taking you along. What happens? This is a very interesting point that has been raised. That's why I put it across to all of you. That when we deal with the mind, first of all, we have a problem, which is the mind, which is ourself. We have knotted ourselves so tightly. The mind and the soul are so, uh, so tight, tightly knotted together, so much intertwined, that when they function in consciousness, we can't even know which is the mind, which is the soul. But separating them by saying, the seeker is the truth. The seeker of truth is the soul. And this thinking, chattering mind that is giving excuses is the mind. With a simple distinction made like this, then the question comes, how do we fight? Meditation, the mind says, stop it. It's enough. You're tired. Look at your legs. Don't you see your knees? How do they feel? Don't you feel like stretching out? Now, what can you do? You can turn around and say, I am not going to give in. You naughty little mind, I am not going to give in. And we haven't realized at that point that this thought, I am not going to give in, is also the mind. Because all thoughts are mind. When you enter into a dialogue in the head, one saying do this, the other saying don't do it, and you keep up the dialogue as a fight against the mind, you end up not doing your meditation at all. That is a great deception the mind plays. The great deception the mind plays is to come along with you and make you believe it is going with you. For example, egoism, to be very haughty, is not a good thing. It's one of the five perversions that keeps you away. So the mind says, you say, I am not, I'm never going to boast and tell people I am so and so. I'm, I'll tell I'm humble. I'm very humble. So the mind goes along with you. It says, yes, yes. Say it. It's good. It's right. You say, I am the humblest of the humble. You can't find a humbler person. And we hidden all the ego behind the statement. So in so many areas, the mind takes advantage of these loopholes and hides our weaknesses in its own argument. Therefore, it's not that simple to fight the mind. You can't just fight it out like you would fight a boxer. A boxer, you just put on your boxing gloves and hit. But the mind has to be dealt with in a more subtle way. And the most subtle way is to turn the mind around to do what you are doing. That is why in the use of Simran, the use of mantra, 
I have sometimes suggested. When you are repeating the words, the mind brings another thought in another voice. Don't give up what you are doing. This is also being done with the mind. You always do Simran with the mind. You don't do it on your own. The Simran is done with the mind and heard by you. When we say we repeat the word, we don't repeat the word. We make the mind repeat the word and we listen to it. When any other voice comes, my recommendation is let the other voice also do the Simran. If another figure comes, your wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or somebody else who attracts you and diverts you, and while you are doing this meditation, that form comes. Don't stop doing it. Let that person join at that point and start repeating the same words. Three voices you can hear. You can hear three, four, ten, hundred, thousand. But don't give up. So Simran can be used as a way to bring the mind into the tune. Because it has to, all those are forms of mind. And the forms that the mind puts up are to distract us. And if we keep it around in a subtle way, in a diplomatic way, we can get more out of this uh, enemy which we have to turn into friend than just by fighting it out and tiring us. If we merely fight out, we do our repetition, a thought comes, takes us away. We say, oh no, and we start all over again. Another thought comes, takes us away. We fight that back, start all over again. Another thought comes, fight, push that out. Another image comes, no, 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 I don't want you. I am doing my meditation. Keep on doing your meditation. If this is done continuously in these episodes, after half an hour you are exhausted. Because you are battling all the time. You won every battle, but you lost the war. Because the purpose of the mind was not to win battle. The purpose of the mind was to keep the war going on. You can see This, therefore, is not a simple answer that we can give to your question. How much fight to put on? And the fight has to be a very subtle one. And part of the fight is done with the adversary, against the adversary. Which is tough. If I have a, a we, we sometimes say in uh, meetings that we hold in India, you know, open meetings in the villages, once a dog came, they get the dog out, shoo, shoo. The dog wouldn't go. Some stray dog from somewhere came and was disturbing the meeting. Somebody said, very easy, catch the dog's tail and beat him with it. Now, if you catch the dog's tail and beat him, you're holding the dog there. How will the dog go? <clears throat> very often, in our fight with the mind, we are fighting the mind with the mind and holding it on there. We are not quietening it, not letting go of it. To let go of the mind and to carry on our own business, one of the solutions, if it is too tough, every individual has its own experience, has his or her own experience. If it is too tough, to handle this mind's battles constantly, then it's best to let the mind battle and shift the attention to contemplation, dhyan, the image of the beloved, and rejoice in that love for the beloved to an extent that it becomes insignificant for the mind. So we have to use these contemplation, repetition, and listening to the sound in combinations of various kinds till we get on with the sound that can pull us inward. Yes. One thought that I found useful is that it's useful in life, not just in meditation. It's all these thoughts are just clouds that are passing. You don't have to get on the cloud and ride with it to see the sky. Because the clouds will just pass. The thoughts will just pass if you identify with the sky. Yes. If you... If it's a storm, watch it go by. Yes. If you can separate yourself and let the storm go by, it's a good technique. The, the initial sound, the initial quick tongue, 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 the sound of the bell and some other sounds are related to the physical processes going on, including the circulatory system. So when you concentrate in the head, and the concentration in the initial stages is more physical than purely con in consciousness, then the blood vessels of the head can create the pulsation. It can last for some time. It goes away when you realize that you are not really meditating with the body. You are meditating with thought, imagination, consciousness. As you move away from using the body for meditation to using your consciousness and imagination alone, irrespective of the body, this goes away. Yeah. So when body consciousness is lost, this also goes. Yes. Questions related to, to time and, and duty. 
uh, in my in meditation, uh, you know, I sometimes have a notion of time, like how much time do I have to do the meditation, and how much time should I spend in the meditation, as if, at least if I make some effort to do some meditation, I'm fulfilling a duty or an obligation that I feel that I have of serving. What about Lord. giving 10% of time? That's the goal, is to give, be able to give 10%. And yes. I figure, well, if I don't spend 10% or two and a half hours in meditation, at least if I spend it in contemplation, I'm all right. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. No, 10% is total. It does not mean 10% in each one of them. 10% in total. And so when I get to the meditation, the mind comes in, and I don't... I say to myself, I don't want to bail, but then it gets worse. I just stop and I do contemplation. That's right. You complete. It's easier for me to meditate, so I stick with that. Correct. Shift from one to the other. Do 10% in all in 24 hours is as many sessions as you like. Don't do it all in one go. If you can't do it in one go, do it in two, three times, in two, three forms. It seems to me you can't really get to these higher regions unless you can spend two and a half hours in the meditation. That is true. But you'll get used to it. It will come. <laughs> yes, any other question at this time? Yes. You spoke before about um, the soul and the self being side by side. Is that, is that right? <clears throat> so the soul is... The soul is the self. The soul is the self. Yes. This is the soul is the seeker. The soul is the seeker. The listener. The listener. Does it... Originate action? No. The listener doesn't originate action. Action originated by the mind. All actions originate by the mind. Therefore, all karma comes from the mind. The soul can create no karma. If you transcend the mind and go above it in spiritual experience and realization, you are above karma. There is a stage available where you can just go above karma. Even if the karma is for millions of years to go round and round here, to be able to go above the mind into this pure spiritual region, leave the mind behind. In spiritual experience, not in thought. In spiritual experience, you go above karma. Because karma is where the thought or the intention leads to action. And since listening does not lead to action, it is the speaking that leads to action. Therefore, the mind alone is responsible for action. Any other question? <clears throat> well, to have the uh, uh, last uh, exercise, would you like to have one more or are you tired? One more. One more. Now, remember, we are going to utilize all the principles that we have uh, practiced since morning and put them together, realizing that there is a door which opens to the spiritual journey within. It's called 10th door. It's called the 10th door. Why is it called 10th door? Because there are nine other apertures on the body. The, the two eyes, the ears, the nose, mouth, rectum, the productive organ, all these nine apertures like doors on this body, all of these nine doors are serving to take our attention outside. These nine doors open outward and give our contact and connection with the world. And they have been responsible for our attachments, desires, pleasures of the world. These nine doors have taken us out. And behind the eyes at the tenth door, the third eye or the tenth door is the opening that takes us to our inner journey. That's why it's called the tenth door. So that space behind is the one when you close these nine don't operate these nine, open the tenth, your journey is better. If you also operate these nine and say, I also want to operate the tenth, it is difficult. Because the routes are different. In the case of the nine doors, the attention is going out. In the case of the tenth door, the attention is going within. So during meditation, we are trying to shut off the nine doors and sitting there. It's like a railroad station. It's like an airport. It is not a final station. It is a gathering point. Remember, 10th door, just concentrating your attention behind the eyes is not completion of a journey. It's the beginning of the journey. When you get initiated by a perfect living master 
or if you have been initiated by a perfect living master your duty ends when you can be there and see the radiant form the lighted up form of your master which appears at that point after that the journey is in companionship not alone all the other stages right to the top you can have in the company of the enlightened one whose form you first saw outside and inwardly you see the lighted form of it and that goes with you the radiant form of your master within is the real companion the real what makes the journey interesting to tell you the truth i would be really very loath to travel in this unfriendly skies all the way just by myself flying up in the air that i'm going home to my own region and i've left all the other spiritual seekers behind i am great i'm going alone on a solitary journey i wouldn't like that kind of journey but if i find i've got good company of a master whom i loved before i started the journey whose face i saw when i was still outside and who attracted me and i said there is something there and that same face with illumination with light with the whole face and whole body full of light light emanating from the feet light emanating from the face from the eyes i can see that face inside and that's going to be my companion that master will say let's go i love that kind of life this is the advantage of getting initiation from a perfect living master that he is with us from that airport onwards throughout the flight on the train from that railroad station all the journey so therefore that point which we are talking of is only going up to the railroad station the journey starts from there the journey starts from the tenth door behind the eye so what i have introduced to you is only a preparation to go to the point where for initiate the journey begins in the company of the master in a radiant form so go back to that point use these methods of repetition of mantra or simran contemplation of the beloved face of the master or any other beloved you have if you don't have a master listen to the sound when it comes use what is pulling you to stay further in the third eye center keep awake don't go to sleep and enjoy whatever sights and sounds come remember do not leave the third eye center if something beautiful comes in front of you a nice rainbow and a nice colored lights and other lights and colored waterfalls lot of things come in front of them don't leave them to go forward to see them stay back when you will go lean forward they will disappear when you stay back till the third eye center more will come therefore don't leave the third eye center those experiences are coming because we are at the third eye center and not leaving it they don't come if you leave and lean forward to go after them if any faces come any other experiences come any memories come let them float by they will float and go from one direction to another just like this and change like a television screen use the front portion in front the darkness in front of you as it gets lighted up and has images and memories use it like a television screen when you watch the tv you don't run after it you stay in your comfortable chair and if you don't like it use a little remote remote control but don't leave the chair in the third eye center so stay in the third eye center watch what comes and let it go and enjoy and relax there close your eyes and begin first locate yourself in third eye center make sure look around then do the repetition of mantra when you are more steady with that then do the contemplation keep your eyes closed till i count 5 One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look to the side. Come out or wake up, whatever. <clears throat> How was this session? Anyone enjoyed it? Please raise your hands. Those who like this session. Thank you. Thank you. Very good result of the workshop.
when you have seen the great master or a master within during this practice exercise, when you have heard the sound within, when you have felt an intense seeking, you can't wait and you are restless for it. If any of these things have happened, that means you are ready for initiation. Or you already been initiated. How many of you feel with this criteria that you are ready for initiation? Raise your hand. Those who feel you are ready for initiation. Thank you. When one is ready for initiation, one comes across a perfect living master. The rest is formality to get initiated. So it's a na all natural path and the the way is natural, the method is natural, not only within, even outside. And the life changes. As we go on the spiritual path, our day-to-day -day life and occurrences change. You will find that. I hope that you enjoyed this workshop as much as I did. And we look forward to seeing you again when I come here. Thank you very much.